It's a real honor to be invited to come up and speak to all of you and doing so many interesting and distinguished things. So thank you so much for uh, your time and attention. And it's a real joy to uh, be able to see Ken again. Um, you're all very lucky to be able to work with him. I know uh, I was and uh, uh, am glad that we're able to keep up our professional connections as well. Um, as Ken bored you with a little bit of my background, um, Maybe the part that, so you can kind of get an aesthetic a little bit for the presentation, kind of where my center of gravity is. I really focus on kind of two things which I find to be oddly related. Uh, one is kind of app dev and cloud infrastructure, uh, and the other is kind of CRM and customer facing systems. So for whatever reason, those are uh, my personal interests, and a lot of what um, I'm going to talk about comes from my experience uh, working in those domains. Um, so what are we here to talk about? And uh, when I, I spent a lot of time, I'm very lucky to spend a lot of time talking to early stage companies. And uh, this is a little bit where the kind of center of gravity again of this talk comes from. So help me uh, steer it to where it's most useful. But uh, even at the most basic level, uh, kind of thinking about you know, what is marketing? What are the problems that we're um, trying to solve? Uh, what, one of the things that's really, really interesting that's happened over the past, you know, it's only been kind of five years or so, is kind of the bottoms up, up side of marketing. Really, the stuff that we think about in terms of customer acquisition, activation, retention, funnel, right? All of those kind of marketing mechanics, which are, of course, essential to a company's success. You know, 10 years ago, you didn't find technologists and product people talking about those problems. So... As a marketer, it's fascinating and encouraging uh, for me that there's so many new ideas coming into that space as that's now become, frankly, the domain of technologists, right? You would expect if you uh, interviewed a random developer tomorrow for your company uh, that they likely would have some aesthetic for you know, how customer acquisition or activation or all those kinds of uh, growth mechanics or growth hacking works. Uh, and there are a lot of great people who um, are, are establishing that new art. Uh, someone I was lucky enough to work with, Avon Kieran, I encourage you to look at his stuff. He ran uh, Growth at Dropbox, wonderful guy. He's got a new startup called YesGraph. Um, all of which is to say, that's not what I'm gonna talk about today. I love that stuff. Um, if there's questions in q and I'm happy to kind of speak to that. It's obviously essential. What's interesting to me is as those tactics and that kind of part of marketing has become um, again, more the domain of people like us, startup people and product people, uh, there's still that top-down part, right? The stuff that's about the positioning and the pricing and the PR and sales enablement that still it retains a little bit more mystery. And I think for many people I interact with in the startup community, it's something that somebody else does. And so what I was hoping to do today in as an entertaining way as possible is just kind of talk about how I frame that problem, um, maybe demystify that a little bit, and fundamentally talk about why it's important um, and uh, why I care so much. And again, I spend a lot of time talking to developers about becoming marketers, and this is kind of my pep talk slide, which is to say that um, really the future of marketing has been defined by developers. And I'm a big believer in the idea that if you look at kind of marketing practice, um, if you go back and look at the history of marketing to developers, traditionally done by developers, that actually tends to foretold uh, 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 what's going to happen in marketing in general. And I like to go back even to some of the original kind of developed marketing stuff. Uh, most famously, you know, think about kind of the Mac platform launch in 1984, people like Guy Kawasaki, all those guys who you know. But if you think about what are the techniques of developer marketing, right, what did we have? We had online communities. We had user-generated content. It was all content marketing, it was bottoms up, right? Adoption into the enterprise. All the stuff that we're talking about is state of the art marketing practice today. All of that emanates from developers marketing to developers. Again, the point of which is uh, developers have often had a hand in uh, defining the future of marketing. So uh, feel like you're in good company as you continue to do so. Okay. This is one of my favorite ads of all time. Who doesn't love the Next marketing stuff? This was the original uh, Next launch ad from, I believe, 88 or 89. I haven't been able to quite pin it down. 
The premise of which was, you know, here are seven big ideas in the future of computing, and this is what Next was going to deliver in the 90s. For all of you who are still lugging around your rewritable octable disks, um, that was uh, and booting your OS off of them. Um, I will uh, resist the temptation to go into obscure next step trivia, uh, other than to say that the point of the slide is that this is how the talk will be organized. I want to talk about seven points um, uh, and kind of ideas of product marketing and uh, uh, hopefully be able to spend a little bit of time in each one of them. Okay, number one. If you remember one slide from this entire presentation, um, I encourage you to uh, uh, think about this one. Um, and really what this came from is, you know, again, I've had the, the luck to be able to spend a lot of time working with early stage companies, and I kept drawing the same picture on the board as we started to talk about uh, company positioning and company framing, and kind of just ended up reducing it down to this, so I kind of offer that here, which is, you know, fundamentally, what are the properties and characteristics of the companies that we admire most and who that we, we want to emulate? Right, if you were to kind of really try and reduce that down, and um, you know, we can obviously all hold up Apple as a, a good example of that. And in kind of reflecting on that, it seems that there are really two properties uh, in kind of two dimensions that we're trying to execute on. The first is that we want to be strategic, right? And by strategic, um, I mean that we have in, uh, we're driving uh, our respective industries. Right, that we are uh, an influential um, uh, center player uh, that is able to exert real importance and impact in whatever happening in the industry is. And certainly you can imagine um, how Apple right, typifies that on you know, so many different dimensions. Uh, whether it's the transition from uh, desktop to mobile, obviously that's a massive strategic piece of property they own, whether it's the future of media, whether it's music, right, they occupy this incredibly strategic uh, position. Uh, the other uh, is the emotive dimension, right, and that's, it's the combination of these things I think that makes Apple uh, so powerful because of course Apple is this um, incredibly emotive, personal uh, uh, kind of brand. And I like to be explicit about that because sometimes, you know, a lot of times when people like talk about Apple and oh, gee, isn't Apple great? We love Apple and brands like Apple and Harley-Davidson and stuff like that. It's like, well, you know what? Um, Harley-Davidson is really right. Where would they fit on this graph? People love their products. They're passionate about them. But what's strategic about being a, you know, semi-commodity uh, motorcycle manufacturer, right? It's actually probably not that awesome a business. So something like Harley-Davidson, great emotive qualities, crappy strategic qualities, right? So what we're trying to do is do both. So that's the good news. The bad news is where all of you are today, because all of us are here today, which is in the opposite, opposite side, right? We all have low emotive, low strategic products because we're all startups, we're all early stage companies. And so the question is, how do we think about kind of traversing this space? How do we become more strategic and emotive? And I hope it's somewhat self-evident why um, that's a valuable thing to do in terms of defining your position and your message. Uh, but then if you accept that, then what are kind of the, the tactics and strategies we'll use uh, to get there? So let's think about a couple more companies and companies who do this well versus companies who do this poorly. Um, it's funny, if you look at it, a lot of enterprise companies, right, what we think of as traditional enterprise companies, tend to just kind of do well on the strategic dimension, right? Oracle is clearly a strategic company. What Oracle decides to do with their products or their sales strategy or their corporate organization, that's going to have important uh, repercussions across the enterprise software industry. Oracle couldn't have a lower emotive quality, right? I, I don't understand how that works. I don't understand the meetings they have internally where like, you know, they spend all this money on a billboard and then spend like three minutes in Photoshop to actually create the, the creative for it. That's just part of their MO. God, I guess it's working for them, right? But so very high strategic, very low emotive quality. Um, you can think about other companies like Intel, right, who kind of, kind of struggle to move up the, uh, the emotive quality. Um, and of course, uh, there's nothing quite as sad as a company that thinks they're emotive uh, and isn't, or even worse, thinks they're strategic and isn't. And we see all this kind of backsliding happening in the industry as companies struggle with their positioning. So a classic example is somebody like Sun, 
right? 13 years ago, Sun was really strategic, really important. Now, of course, you know, they're acquired or they're slightly irrelevant. I like to pick on them because it's fun and also because they have my favorite example of kind of the worst grasp at this kind of emotional quotient that I've seen, which is for all of you who had the mispleasure of being at Java World 2001, I believe it was. That's when Sun, were there any of you guys there? That's when Sun, you're like, I wasn't even in college then. Uh, that's when Sun announced that Britney Spears was going to be the spokesperson for Java. Uh, true story. And uh, Britney Spears was like on the homepage of Java.com. It's like, you can understand what they were trying to do in spirit, but man, that was, that was kind of sad. Okay, so I've gotten my um, son ding in. Uh, um, and uh, uh, so it's fascinating, right, to watch kind of these companies kind of struggle in the strategic dimension. Um, uh, Microsoft obviously is struggling that, right? Think about the core narrative of Microsoft as a company where they sit on this uh, and, and kind of how um, uh, how that affects their overall kind of market presence. So how do you get right to the upper right hand corner? And to me it kind of feels like there tends to be two paths. If you're uh, a more traditional kind of enterprise B2B company, you tend to uh, become strategic first and then emotive, if you're lucky, right? If you're a, um, uh, a consumer oriented company, it tends to be this more kind of a motive than strategic path. So, and I'll give you two examples. So, uh, I spend a lot of time at Salesforce, and if you, you can really frame any one of these spaces in these kind of two very different ways, uh, and I'll do two examples here. So, one is Salesforce. If you guys remember way back to the kind of early 2000s when Salesforce was getting started, the world of contact management was a crappy commodity, low-end kind of nasty space. Right, um, and uh, you know, kind of typical. You can think of everything that's kind of low emotive, low strategic, right? All the way down in the corner is like stuff like malware, right? It's just like awful, terrible, you know, or like link spam, right? That's just the worst, right? So, in the world of contact management, it wasn't that much better. Like all of these like little crappy address managers, right? You know, uh, uh, that you could all download, and um, you know, they're all a little bit funky all the way from there to being this you know, strategic product that was uh, uh, you know, the center of your company's IT strategy, right? That was a huge kind of transformation. Um, I'd argue that if you look at uh, another space I'm familiar with, you know, in kind of file sharing, think about the world of kind of file and FTP utilities, right? Think about you know, all of the crappy like FTP clients that live here or even file sharing as a space itself and all the connotations with that. And now think about your own connotations that you have with companies like Dropbox or products like Google Drive, right, or Box.net. So there's this kind of subtle transformation and framing that happens where all of a sudden you go from being this kind of very unstrategic product to being this, wow, this is kind of an important um, uh, player in the industry. And think about kind of how those companies are affecting that change. So, uh, again, in the Salesforce example, and I'll talk a little more depth about this, you know, crappy contact manager to kind of essential part of corporate infrastructure, right? That was the move to strategic, but equally as important was the move to emotive. And hopefully you guys, if you're familiar with Salesforce, can appreciate the fact that the brand is a little more lively and fun than something like an SAP or an Oracle brand, right? The rule was 10 years ago, well, that's just how enterprise companies are. They don't need to do this, right? What does Salesforce do in response? They're so concerned and they spend so much energy and time uh, on trying to create these emotive qualities. Um, I often joke that uh, if you've ever, haven't been to like a Salesforce event like a Dreamforce or something like that, you guys are familiar with the production values, which, you know, are off the charts. I joke it's like a Pixar movie, like the amount of attention to detail. M my favorite is uh, they have this character, Sassy, which is kind of the logo right, running around as a person and a mascot, that's actually played by uh, the same person who does the, the San Francisco Giants seal, right? So you've got like the best character mascot, you know, that you could possibly get in the Bay Area just to do your kind of, you know, in-person event thing. Why? Because you care so much about representing the emotive quality of the brand. And you can think about how well that's played off for Salesforce in creating this very powerful brand, but also creating this powerful differentiation in the market, how differently you think of a Salesforce than you do an SAP. Um, 
I'll give another company credit uh, on the kind of strategic dimension, if you guys are familiar with Box. It wasn't that long ago, and certainly when I was at Dropbox, Box was the dregs, man. You know, Box is what you use to tweet links to your MP3s. Like, this was, this was low-rent stuff. And now, right, Box is, people are saying, God bless them, that Aaron like, should be CEO of Microsoft. Right, and that box is defining the future of all this kind of stuff. And credit to them, right? How did they affect that change? Is there something really different about the product? Was it some massive you know, change in functionality that enabled them to go from super low strategic to high strategic? No. They took the Salesforce playbook around kind of cloud and right, um, uh, industry transformation and just played that to a T. Okay. Um, that's strategic. If you think about a motive, I would uh, uh, encourage you to think about, you know, kind of the first experiences that you had with products like Twitter or Instagram. Certainly when I first used Twitter, like a lot of people probably, it's like, what the hell is this thing, right? Or Instagram. It's like, great, it's another way of taking photos. And it goes from, oh, it's really beautiful. It's a beautiful product. It's fun. It lets me connect with, you know, my friends, high emotional quality. But like, what the hell is it good for? And then all of a sudden, there's this kind of profound and distinct shift where now it's a challenge to Facebook and all of the ad revenue that Facebook represents, right? And all of a sudden, it moves from being kind of a motive to that upper white hand corner. Okay. I'll put in my one cautionary tale because it's my pet peeve of the industry. The least emotive thing you can do ever is use stock photography. And I think you guys are probably sophisticated enough to know that, but when I see a company that puts stock photography on their website or uh, on their decks, it's just like, right, we couldn't care less about uh, uh, representing any real emotion. So um, please avoid that. Um, but hopefully that makes sense as kind of a broad framework of thinking about uh, where we're trying to go. So the question is then, okay, well, how do we get there? Number two. Industry transformation narrative. Uh, this is probably the most famous slide I've ever made. If any of you have been to a Dreamforce event or a Salesforce event, you've seen some derivation of it. This slide is vintage. It's actually uh, is over 10 years old now. And this is the slide that Salesforce used and uses to kind of describe its positioning, right? Salesforce frames itself as being part of an industry transformation, right? The shift from, and this is of course the fascinating thing about our industry, the shift from client server, represented by companies like SAP and Oracle, to, uh, at the time we weren't using cloud, that was before cloud, we used the word on demand. Um, and, uh, but obviously this kind of internet model of distributing services. There was nothing about Salesforce's product, which in the early 2000s was pretty a low featured contact management solution that had anything in natively to do with this message, right? Why did Salesforce use this message? It used it in order to affect that kind of position on the strategic dimension, right? And to um, put themselves into a broader discussion and to achieve that differentiation. Same thing that, of course, Box is doing now. Um, and uh, uh, we've seen really is the driver for the companies that we really think about you know, wow, these guys are uh, an important player in the industry, right? They're always, there's always some core industry transformation narrative that's kind of the engine behind it, right? So for a company like Zynga, it was the transition from uh, console gaming to social gaming and casual gaming. For um, Facebook, right, it was the idea that discovery was moving from, and the corresponding ad dollars from search to social. Right, so all of these companies that we monitor, that underneath all of them is this idea of industry transformation. And again, uh, we've seen so many companies now. It's amazing how the cloud story continues to uh, just be the gift that uh, keeps on giving in terms of powering this kind of narrative. I thought it would have been played out like a decade ago, right? But man, it just keeps going, right? Uh, so of course, the question is, what is your industry transformation narrative? And my bet is that it's some derivation of this, which is the internet changes everything, 
right? And literally, like, when I write press releases, and you can go back to the archives and probably see this in all the companies that I've worked at, there'll be a line in there probably which is just the internet changes everything. The internet, as all of you know, is the core technical, cultural, economic force of our lifetimes. That's it, you know, <laughs> that's what it's gonna be. So all we're really doing is just kind of referencing all of the ways in which uh, this thing is changing every aspect of our lives and economy and is fundamentally driving industry transformation. So there's an, if you don't know what your narrative is, I don't care if you're selling um, you know, digital door handles or projectors, there's some, you know, the internet changes everything line that at least puts you on that kind of strategic uh, differentiation path. Okay, number three, this is one of my um, favorite Salesforce lines, which is, it's better to be different than it is to be right. And again, I offer this in particular to developers who often understandably think with a framing of, you know, kind of accuracy as the goal, but that's not the goal when it comes to thinking about your products. The goal is to think about being different. And um, uh, <laughs> I, so I, I live in Coal Valley, and uh, uh, I live near Craig Newmark, who some of you might know from Craigslist. I ran into him in the train a couple years ago. He's like, oh, what are you up to? What are you doing? I'm working at this company, um, Salesforce. He's like, yeah, you guys have that no software logo, right? I'm like, yeah, you know, we're doing this you know, cloud stuff, whatever. He's like, ah, but there must be software, right? How does that work? Of course there's software. It's like, yeah, there's software, but that's not the point, right? The point of the differentiation was that Salesforce was positioning itself against an industry model, right? It was the essence of the positioning was the negation of something else. Differentiation was so deeply woven into what it's doing. Um, if you don't have differentiation, right, it, it's hard to uh, uh, imagine how um, you ultimately become successful. How you talk about, if you think about the limited amount of bandwidth you have to talk about, attention you have, that you'll earn to talk about your products. If it isn't just eminently and immediately clear what is fundamentally different about you, uh, your, you know, uh, your opportunities are gonna be lost. You, you can even take a look at the social networking landscape, right, and think about, you know, I don't know what the difference between Bebo and Facebook was, but I certainly understand the difference between Twitter and Facebook. Or I understand the difference between Oracle and Salesforce. I don't need to be an expert in the industry, right, to parse these kinds of things. Um, I'll tell a random uh, Salesforce story here, which kind of speaks to some of the positioning a little bit. I'm sorry, Dropbox story, um, which maybe I shouldn't tell because I'm at Google, but this was many years ago, so I can uh, speak to it now. Uh, so The Economist calls up and says they're working on a story about, and this is like, you know, 2009, 2010, you know, when Google was perception-wise maybe on a little more pressure than it is today, right? Why is Google kind of losing out to these startups like Facebook and Twitter and yada, and they want to do the story and they want to put Dropbox in it, which is absolutely the last thing that we want because, you know, there's no good that's going to come of that in any measure. What is the story that a company like Dropbox does want, right? It's that we're competing against a model, right? That there's a model of traditional PCs hooked up in LANs using Windows 3.1 to share files. And there's a, mo a, a new model, which is multiple devices that are you know, uh, intermittently connected that are uh, sharing uh, data across companies. And that's a fundamental industry transformation. And in what may be one of my greater PR achievements of all time, the um, article end up having more of a kind of a message about um, what is Microsoft and the Windows model, right, ultimately uh, kind of doing wrong and what are they losing out to? Or at least that's how Dropbox was kind of positioned in there. So a lot of this is who you're trying to compete with and who you're trying to differentiate against and why. And you could argue, does Dropbox compete with Windows, right? Do you go into Best Buy, not that anybody buys software that's like this anymore, and, you know, see Dropbox on the shelf next to Windows? Of course not. But it does from a model point of view, conceptually, right? You're either investing in Windows, land manager, and VPN, and local SAN, and everything around that kind of traditional 30-year-old Microsoft stack, or you're gonna use something that's a fundamental architecture that's based around kind of a post-PC world, right? So 
again, how you're framing all this differentiation uh, counts for a lot. Okay. So far, so good? All right. All right. You guys with me? Okay, good. Um, number four. This one I'm particularly religious about. Um, again, especially kind of B2B companies, I think, do uh, a poor job here. And um, this is the idea of ingredient branding. And tell a random story to kind of highlight how we think about this. I was at the Ferry Building the other day, and uh, there was a vendor there selling um, kind of traditional, like, 60s treats, you know, like crappy treats like Pop-Tarts and Ho-Hos and these kinds of things, except they were all made with hyper-artisanal ingredients, right? It's like very Portlandia. But it's a classic example of like, what, what's the difference? It's the ingredient. Why ingredient branding is so important is because it, it be, becomes the physical manifestation or the conceptual manifestation of all of those ideas about what, your, what makes your company and your products different. So that somebody can say, well, you know, it's different because this, you know, because of that, because of whatever. No, it's different because of th it has this one thing. So a classic example, right, is the mouse. Was the mouse the key technical difference for the Mac? Wasn't it the fact that it had a faster processor or more RAM or, you know, better graphics capability or more modern operating system or better applications? Was it really this, you know, thing with the ball or whatever? No, but the mouse became the stand-in for everything that was fundamentally differentiated about the Mac. There's an example that Ken used to give that I like to talk about a lot, which is the pause button on the TiVo. And if you guys have heard Ken talk about his story on this, right, why is that the biggest button on the remote? Because it's the thing that makes the TiVo the most different. This is way back when, right, that what does it do that's so fundamentally different? It pauses live TV. It's the most different thing. Um, I'd argue that... Uh, the single most valuable world, word created in kind of infrastructure and IT of the past decade, right, is virtual machine in the VMware sense, right? That's tens and tens and tens of billions of dollars of spending right there. On that kind of, what makes VMware different? It's the virtual machine. Could we have a long esoteric technical argument about whether that's the best way of representing exactly what's different about it? Probably. Or like my random favorite example, right? What made uh, the DeLorean in Back to the Future special? Anyone? Exactly. Here we are, 30 years later, we remember what is the thing that makes the DeLorean different? It's the flux. What was that was the thing with lights, right? Did it, what did it do? Who knows? Who cares? But it allowed us to imagine and invest, right, this thing with a set of ideas about what makes it fundamentally different. Um, there's an example here, uh, I'll use kind of a Google Salesforce example to kind of flesh this out a little bit. Um, one thing that I, I was not uh, as happy kind of how it turned out with was how Salesforce branded its database. It turns out that Salesforce really um, has a ton of very, very interesting intellectual property, kind of the database level. But we never really branded it well from an ingredient point of view. You contrast that to something like Google Bigtable or now things like Mongo or even you know, Hadoop or these kinds of things, right? These are uh, you know, ingredient brands that allow us to think about kind of fundamentally what's, what's different. So really uh, important, something that I would um, uh, pay a lot of attention to. <coughs> okay, number five, leverage acquisition. Uh, this is my kind of message to um, BD people uh, which is that really BD is product marketing. And if you're thinking about BD as like straight BD deal terms, unless you have a very particular business model that's channel based, which nobody really has in the internet era, or few of, our, few of us have in the internet era, uh, you might be th uh, thinking about it um, in a less useful way. So, uh, and I'll talk about a couple examples of, of from Salesforce here, and explicitly what we were trying to do, and this is the early days of the Salesforce platform, is right, we're trying to get as many developers as possible engaged with this thing. So what was our approach? We wanted to go where the developers are, right? Uh, we wanted to kind of practice this leveraged acquisition. How are we, at the time, the biggest developer community was the Microsoft developer community, how are we gonna infiltrate that? Uh, our, you know, our approach was um, 
What I like to think about is MVP, which is minimal viable product uh, or minimal viable marketing for the sake of a product or a partnership. So what's the smallest, if you think about this from kind of a product and marketing point of view rather than from a straight BD point of view, right? What's the um, smallest product, simplest product you can create that will carry your message uh, so that you can deliver that through uh, another company's channel, right, as a way of um, ultimately uh, acquiring customers for your own business. And uh, I say this because I have a lot of conversations with startups where, you know, they've got an opportunity to, you know, do a deal with some big company and they go through all these machinations like, oh, we've got to port our whole stack over this other thing or I, I literally remember when uh, one time, uh, AMD, this is like 10 years ago, so I'm allowed to say it, or 12 years ago, AMD wanted Salesforce to switch um, entirely to AMD processors, right? This part is like, well, you know what, maybe there's a different kind of relationship that we can craft that will make everybody just as happy. Uh, 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 and um, at Salesforce, we're able to use this to great effect. Uh, so for example, um, with Microsoft, we created a simple wrapper around our, a comm wrapper around our API, launched that with great fanfare, um, at the Office Developers Conference, and you know, we're able to kind of leverage this amazing marketing muscle that Microsoft had uh, to that end. Uh, it's not on here, but my favorite example of this is Skype. Um, this is again probably like uh, eight, nine years ago now, um, but one of the things that we uh, were interested in was kind of you know, partnering with Skype so we could position ourselves alongside Skype because, right, it represented next generation telephony, part of this new model, right? So we we're trying to position ourselves with and around these companies at Salesforce. And so it turned out that what you could do was with a kind of simple JavaScript invocation, you know, pass multiple phone numbers and create a conference call. So we wrote literally like three lines of code that um, put allowed you from Salesforce to create a conference call, like all the people on the, on the account page or whatever it was, right, and kind of initiate that via Skype. And of course, then we wrap that in all this message about kind of the future of software and the future of telephony and this whole new model, right, big industry transformation. That thing was in the Wall Street Journal three times, right? The ratio of lines of code to amount of coverage. And this was not a traditional BD exercise. There was no contract. Right? It wasn't a bunch of BD people talking in a room. What it was was product people working with each other right? where they had a problem. A great example here is Adobe. When Adobe launched uh, Flex, if you remember that product, right? their interest was um, uh, making this thing appear enterprise-y right? for enterprise app dev. Our interest was reaching deve web developers, which Adobe owns. Right? So we kind of spoke to each other product to product, let's try and support each other's messages rather than like thinking about this thing as some kind of economic traditional BD opportunity. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, I encourage you to uh, uh, very actively think about um, kind of BD and partnerships that way. Okay, continuing on my staccato tour of product marketing. Um, this might be the second most important slide because I think it's the thing that a lot of early stage companies um, have the least aesthetic for, which is the importance and power of repetition in your message. Um, and uh, I worked with a guy who ran communications at Salesforce, wonderful guy, Bruce Francis. It was randomly like in my 512th um, Salesforce marketing meeting and Bruce just randomly like spurts out, uh, repetition is the soul of modernity, right? And what he was doing was communicating why are we out there with the same message again and again and again. If you look at, if you go to Dreamforce in two months, whatever it is, right, what you'll probably see is some derivation of that slide that I showed you. That same slide, that same message is still being used now 11 years later. Why, right? Because that's how, uh, that message is still new to a lot of people, it's still current, it still fundamentally frames uh, the company and the value. What it's the job of the product marketing people to do is to repeat it until they can't stand it anymore. And um, uh, one of the most important lessons I learned at Salesforce is how to launch the same product multiple times, right? 
And again, it comes down to that like kind of minimal viable marketing product, right? What's the absolute smallest piece of thing that we need to credibly add and to make this thing new? And it was because these, the, the messages themselves, the product launches, they were the toast points to convey the foie gras of the core message, right? Your individual discrete launches are in service of whatever your core narrative is. And in that way, each launch is just an opportunity to repeat what your core message is. It's counterintuitive. It's counterintuitive to how a lot of us think about communication, the idea that we're just going to say the same thing again and again and again and again. Uh, and what I try and help people do is like think about repeating that message until like their mouth is dry, until they can't stand themselves, uh, hear it uh, uh, again and again. You're like a rock band playing, you know, you're Skinner and you're going to play Freebird for the next 40 years and you should love it because that is your job. It is to, once you have that message, to repeat it as much as you can possibly bear. And again, we just need to refer to Warhol, Warhol to understand why that's important. That's just kind of obviously fundamentally the nature of modern communication and media. To that end, number seven, how to then think about PR. So we've got our message. We understand we're doing uh, industry transformation. This is going to help us become more strategic um, and emotive. Uh, we understand that at the core of that is going to be differentiation, that um, uh, we're going to use our partners in kind of a product-oriented way rather than a partnership revenue-oriented way to uh, convey that and drive growth. And uh, we're going to repeat it a lot, so it's time now for your... Uh, kind of interaction with media and, the, and PR. And I spent a lot of time in meetings talking to people about how they should be thinking about their messages for sake of a launch or a press release. And uh, I talked to a lot of developers in this context and decided, okay, what we need are PR APIs. And the message is that PR has APIs. So don't try and, you know, violate them or invoke APIs that don't exist because it won't work. They, that's just how media is, they have a set of ways in which stories that they expect, and your job is to format your story for their API. Those APIs also have a stack rank in terms of importance. That um, uh, there are certain APIs that you can invoke that will have kind of the least impact, and there are APIs that you can invoke that will have the highest impact. So uh, from kind of most impactful to least, uh, controversy always wins. That's just the fundamental nature, right, uh, of a story. There's no controversy too small to um, be covered too much, right? It's, always, it's dangerous from like a PR plotting territory, but can also, I, I was thinking the other day about, if you know those guys, Aereo in uh, New York, right, that are doing the kind of um, IP-based pseudo cable TV stuff, and uh, Fox went all crazy and you know, threatened to um, pull, was it Fox or CBS, and threatened to pull uh, their signal off the air, off terrestrial broadcast, if these guys were allowed to continue to, to broadcast. And right, the press went wild, and it was like the greatest day ever for Aereo. Probably the best example, which I, is a Google company, uh, uh, is Uber, right? I mean, Uber's entire PR strategy is they have the perfect way to invoke this API. Where would Uber be if it weren't controversial? Nobody would know about it. So that works really well. Um, Kind of. It's dangerous. Uh, uh, the second is acquisition. And this is a random funny story. Uh, I won't name names. It was a startup I was working with. And like, you know, we sweated out this launch. Like, every message was refined. Every press plan was detailed. This thing was like keyed up. This was going to be awesome. And we grinded it out and we did the launch. And like, you know, it was OK. And a couple uh, weeks later, we acquired this company. And it was literally one guy. But we positioned it as an acquisition, you know, and this thing got covered like 10x more. Why? Because that, that API, acquisition API, ranks much higher than a product launch API. Um, this is why I like to think about, always try and think about what can I do uh, in kind of a partnership way um, uh, rather than a product launch way. Even if you just look at like recent Salesforce press, I'm sure not that many of you probably like heard of their new chatter product, whatever it is. But I'm sure a lot of you heard about the Salesforce and Oracle uh, relationship that they just recently announced. Why? Well, it's partnership and controversy, right? This is, this is, this is Pater. Um, so 
think explicitly about the APIs uh, and don't try and invoke APIs that aren't there because it just, uh, 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 they won't exist uh, and work, we'll work out that well. Um, at exactly 40 minutes, grand unifying theory, where do you fit? What are you doing on a day-to-day -day basis to push yourself down the field of being more strategic and more emotive? How is that informing everything that you're doing when you're writing a deck, when you're writing a press release, when you're writing a piece of a blog post? How is that pushing you uh, on those dimensions and the language that you're using? How are you taking advantage of every customer communication or sales communication to uh, uh, frame your progress uh, on crossing that strategic and emotive threshold uh, by invoking uh, your and uh, repeating your industry narrative that is enforcing your differentiation, that you're highlighting and manifesting through your ingredient branding, that you're using your partners to amplify, and that you're repeating often by invoking the right APIs. Seven simple steps. I uh, hope that's helpful, and I think we have some time for Q&A. And I'm happy to answer technical questions as well about your Salesforce or Dropbox issues. Okay, uh, okay, great. How many people here are kind of in a marketing function Oh, awesome, wow. Okay, great. Great. So, uh, can you use the mic, please? Oh, boy. Or maybe we can pass it around, I don't know. Break the rules. So the last time I stood here, I was uh, asking a question of Al Gore. I was ridiculously nervous. That was like six months ago. I'm less nervous to ask a question. Do you want me to do my Al Gore impersonation? Could you I please? Answer? That'd be amazing. Lockbox. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, my name's Neil, I'm with Shape Security. We're okay. a GV company too. Okay. And um, we're launching our product at, at RSA okay. in part of next year. And uh, I, I like the idea of, I forget what you call them, Izzy or something, the Salesforce? No oh, uh, that's, that, that guy's called Sassy, yeah. Sassy, when does a company like, so I, I think it's interesting to be at a company that's in a data center security space mm -hmm. like we are, which is traditionally incredibly, um, you're not terribly emotive. And I think it'd be interesting for us to consider some sort of character or something like that to bring some emotiveness to it. Do we do it at launch or later? When did Salesforce come up with Izzy? Um, I don't love Sassy. Sassy. I, I, if it were up to me, I wouldn't have done it. Um, so there are many routes. That, that's almost to show how uh, the distant Salesforce will go to amplify the emotional kind of quality. Um, and it, it did come pretty far along. But it's interesting, right? So you're a security company. There's nothing more emotive than security. So I'd argue that you're hugely emotive. The question is, how do you take advantage of that with a positive framing? So this was a discussion that comes up in the kind of file management space a lot, which is you can position to kind of positive benefits of things like Google Drive and you know, Box and Dropbox, or you can position to the kind of, right, you know, your house is going to catch on fire and lose everything benefits. And you can see the, di the difference that companies make in those kind of emotive indications. Um, same thing with security. So my question would be, what are positive emotive qualities that you could bring to the security discussion that would be an opportunity for differentiation, right, when the standard security data center message is that half of China is coming to get you right now. So um, hopefully that helps illuminate a little bit kind of how I'd frame it, but yeah, I wouldn't do a character. I think that would be bad. I would think about what is, I mean, look at semantic, right? That, it's like, that's like eating sand, that brand, right? It's so dry. <laughs> so, you know, what are the opportunities to, what does it mean to be an emotive player in that space? But I would also say, right, your first job is to be strategic, which you implicitly have solved somewhat because you're a security company, right? It's not like you're, I don't know. Irrelevant data, you know, compression company or something. Not that those aren't important, this is harder. For all your data compression companies. Uh, question from the audience. Why are some specific tips for product marketing towards small business software employees 
uh, where you're somewhere between consumer and traditional B2B? Uh, that's an excellent question. I appreciate whoever asked that because it allows me to riff on one of my favorite topics, which is I loathe when people say, make a distinction between selling to SMB versus selling to the enterprise because there is no distinction. The distinction is what level there was a dis that distinction is an artifact of the old model where the distribution channels were meant to sell to SMB meant doing direct mail and distribution into CompUSA versus having a direct field sales organization. That distinction doesn't exist anymore. The go-to-market models are different. And so that core distinction doesn't exist. The difference is whether you are selling, when you're selling a given product, let's say it's a product for a 10 people person group. You are either selling that product to the CEO of a small company or to the department head of a large company. That is the distinction. They are both enterprise. So uh, I, I resist deeply the idea that enterprise is this kind of special boundary that um, we approach differently. It is different when you are selling to a 5,000 person company and you're selling to the CEO of a large company. Yes, that's different. But as you guys, I'm sure, all know, even regardless of what you're selling, you're selling to everybody uh, independent of company size. Um, so uh, my tip is to don't make a distinction between small business and enterprise. Even you could say, well, isn't something like financials different? No. Large companies have small departments that run their business off QuickBooks, right? This happens all the time. You go into businesses and like, you know, they're Fortune 500 companies and they've got little pockets of QuickBooks. So uh, I would frame it more in terms of kind of what's that set of people uh, that you're solving a problem for. Uh, was there a question in the audience? Yeah. Hi, so Brian Hutchins from Uber Conference. Uh, so one of the things I've always been impressed about with Dropbox is the ability to have this kind of viral, you know, people sharing. And so I was wondering, so where do you see, you know, the importance of kind of sharing viral coefficient or in, and is there things about Dropbox with uh, kind of having a stored value, uh, stored value in terms of like storage? Does that make it easier than in other types of companies just in general? Um, I'll, There's kind of a lot in there. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. a great question. And obviously, that's a huge part of Dropbox's success. And, and Drew and Arash and Yvonne and those guys uh, deserve a ton of credit for coming up with that. Um, I'll answer the question broadly by saying, kind of surveying the startup early stage company landscape. I feel like innovation and customer acquisition is devalued. And that there's an expectation that, this is, this is particularly true of kind of the enterprise SaaS market right now. That if you're doing an enterprise SaaS company, what you're gonna go do is, you know, you're gonna do a $50 million C, and you're gonna hire a bunch of salespeople, and you're gonna take the sales playbook, and that's your go-to-market sales problem. What that ignores is how much innovation there is in go-to-market, and how the companies I think that we really admire tend to be really innovative there. So Dropbox, certainly, uh, what people forget is how innovative Salesforce was in its own right. So Salesforce was um, kind of co-emergent with search, right, and SEO, SEM. For the first time, that's how people discovered software to purchase. Uh, and on the other side, right, Salesforce, you could do an online trial, actually experience the product before you bought it. This is as natural as breathing to us today. 11 years ago, it was unprecedented, right? So when people try and do that kind of Salesforce playbook, um, uh, what they're forgetting is how innovative and contextual it was to its own time. So my answer is be innovative in that area, uh, uh, whatever that means for your business, rather than just try and emulate some other pattern, which again, I feel like a lot of VCs push people to doing. Yeah, that's what I was wondering if there's ways that even on the data side where you're evaluating and testing out the different ways or if it's just, hey, we did something innovative and got lucky and it just kind of keeps rolling. Um, I guess maybe one tidbit which probably isn't super surprising is the amount of energy and focus that went into, and this is an area that's near and dear to my heart, kind of the customer infrastructure and the systems to support that. So it was a very, very explicitly, there was very little that was accidental in terms of the management and optimization of that program, right? Uh, everything was measured um, uh, uh, um, with incredible detail. Right. Um, and that's uh, one of the things that I am most encouraged to see 
is how much that's part of part of startup culture now. So, yeah. um, I'll put one other random tidbit in there. How much it was everybody's problem. The metrics were so, so widely distributed and became so much part of kind of the company culture that as a marketing guy, I didn't have to think about the developer worrying about whether or not it was in their consciousness. It was just there. It was present, and that is a big, big, big difference than a lot of other cultures that we've all probably been part of. I mean, an amazingly refreshing and a uh, big part of the success. Yeah. Hi, Adam. I'm Adam from uh, Uber Conference. <clears throat> I had a question sort of based on the success of Salesforce in the channels, and I guess lately we've seen uh, Box.net and sure. dr really emerging as you know a big channel brand. Same with Google Apps. I was wondering if there are sort of any myths that, that you can shatter about the development of a channel, because I think a lot of today's startups see you know Salesforce being so enormously successful there over you know 13 year period. They say, hmm, this is easy. We can build an affiliate channel and, and a partner channel. What are some things that you think startups believe that turn out to be kind of baloney about building a channel? Well, uh, let's see how I can offend with this comment. Um, <laughs> I don't believe that there is a channel model for selling SaaS products. Um, and I'm hard pressed. Maybe that's a narrow definition of SaaS but I'm hard pressed to think of one. I mean, obviously the internet is a world of direct sales and direct customer interaction, which implicitly obviates the need for a channel and that kind of model. Um, so uh, I, I certainly saw Salesforce spend a lot of time working on channel um, and it was never, this, uh, appreciate, I haven't been in that company in four years. All of my information is out of date. Things could have totally changed. In my experience, it was never really material to the business. There were parts of the channel, there was ecosystem that was hugely important. There was SI and app development ecosystem. All of that was essential. But literally, people carrying Salesforce you know, in their bag. And uh, frankly, I haven't seen another SaaS company, NetSuite, Zora, maybe I've got this all wrong, Box. Um, uh, that's it. That isn't the model. The model, the channel model, comes more from the Microsoft earlier era, right? And frankly, VMware is a little bit more in that model too, where you're going, you're selling through these kind of mid-tier regional SIs and Cisco. I don't think that that model applies to SaaS. I don't know. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Definitely. Uh, you talked about this question from the audience: differentiation and messaging about controversy. Box used to position itself as an anti-SharePoint. Do you recommend using negative positioning for business software? Uh, e.g. Salesforce killer, QuickBooks killer. Um, I recommend it. It's okay. You know, it's a negative message. That's not always great. It's okay if you're doing it to position, if it's in service of something bigger, if it's in service of the industry narrative. You know, uh, who's that company? Zoho. They go out and these, buy these billboards that somebody spent 30 to 45 seconds putting together. I, I don't know who is the creative person there, but... They need some help. And they put them on like 101 in the airport or whatever, and they say, you know, Zoho, the anti-Salesforce, or whatever the hell it is. It's like, what the hell is this message? This doesn't mean anything to me, right? Your, your position, what, what, how are you different than Salesforce, right? Now, Salesforce might say they're the anti siebel although we, we never really use that language, right? We were anti-software because we were positioning against a model. But okay, maybe if it's going to help be, you know, we're different than or better than a Siebel because we're a different model, that's okay. But it was in service of a bigger message. It just wasn't like a, we're out to kill this, right? That, that to me, um, I'll, I'll, let's, let's call spades spades here. Hightail, a company formerly known as You Send It, put a billboard up on uh, 101 that you may have seen. It says, don't be drop boxed or dropped or something. I'm like, this is possibly the worst ad of all time, right? I mean, what are, they, what are they trying to accomplish? What is their message? That these are brands that you know and that you probably have a positive association with and we're gonna stand for the people that want to encourage you to have a negative association with them? And that's our message? There's gotta be some opportunity for differentiation in this space that's a little bit more meaningful. You know, I, I don't, I mean, the, the space is wide open. Like, you know, go after VPNing. VPNing sucks, doing tokens sucks. Products like you send it help solve that problem, or get visibility, or solve the, you know, your, tat, your email runs out of it. There's lots of things you can talk about why companies get um, uh, obsessed, they get a psychosis with uh, 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 how they frame themselves in their industry, and that to me is a very negative sign when a company gets to the point of emerging those kinds of messages that's not healthy about how they're thinking about their business. Okay. Uh, 
which of the seven points move the needle the most for an online education company? Well, I think for any company, it's going to be what's your industry narrative, right? So if I'm an online education company, what I'm going to talk about is the structural changes that are happening in um, education as a whole, that like in the Clayton Christensen sense of there's disruption happening in the higher education market, um, I would look to do a deal with, I, I don't know what kind of company you are, if it is a traditional kind of like education company, you know, what, what's a deal that you can do that will reinforce that message, a partnership, but there's core structural industry transformation happening in the education business, and how are you aligning yourself um, to that change to increase your strategic uh, uh, positioning. Launch ad from, I believe, 88 or 89. I haven't been able to quite pin it down. The premise of which was, you know, here are seven big ideas in the future of computing, and this is what Next was going to deliver in the 90s. For all of you who are still lugging around your rewritable octopal disks, um, that was, uh, and booting your OS off of them. Um, I will uh, resist the temptation to go into obscure next step trivia. Uh, other than to say that the point of the slide is that this is how the talk will be organized. I want to talk about seven points um, uh, and kind of ideas of product marketing and uh, uh, hopefully be able to spend a little bit of time on each one of them. Okay, number one. If you remember one slide from this entire presentation, um, I encourage you to uh, uh, think about this one. Um, and really what this came from is, you know, again, I've had the, the luck to be able to spend a lot of time working with early stage companies, and I kept drawing the same picture on the board as we started to talk about uh, company positioning and company framing, and kind of just ended up reducing it down to this, so I kind of offer that here, which is, you know, fundamentally, what are the properties and characteristics of the companies that we admire most and who that we, we want to emulate? Right, if you were to kind of really try and reduce that down, and um, you know, we can obviously all hold up Apple as a, a good example of that. And in kind of reflecting on that, it seems that there are really two properties uh, in kind of two dimensions that we're trying to execute on. The first is that we want to be strategic, right? And by strategic, um, It's a real honor to be invited to come up and speak to all of you and doing so many interesting and distinguished things. So thank you so much for uh, your time and attention. And it's a real joy to uh, be able to see Ken again. Um, you're all very lucky to be able to work with him. I know uh, I was and uh, uh, am glad that we're able to keep up our professional connections as well. Um, as Ken bored you with a little bit of my background, um, Maybe the part that, so you can kind of get an aesthetic a little bit for the presentation, kind of where my center of gravity is. I really focus on kind of two things which I find to be oddly related. Uh, one is kind of app dev and cloud infrastructure, uh, and the other is kind of CRM and customer facing systems. So for whatever reason, those are uh, my personal interests, and a lot of what um, I'm going to talk about comes from my experience uh, working in those domains. Um, so what are we here to talk about? And uh, when I, I spent a lot of time, I'm very lucky to spend a lot of time talking to early stage companies. And uh, this is a little bit where the kind of center of gravity again of this talk comes from. So help me uh, steer it to where it's most useful. But uh, even at the most basic level, uh, kind of thinking about you know, what is marketing? What are the problems that we're um, trying to solve, uh, what, one of the things that's really, really interesting that's happened over the past, you know, it's only been kind of five years or so, is kind of the bottoms up A in as an entertaining way as possible is just kind of talk about how I frame that problem, um, maybe demystify that a little bit, and fundamentally talk about why it's important um, and uh, why I care so much. And again, I spent a lot of time talking to developers about becoming marketers. And this is kind of my pep talk slide, which is to say that um, really the future of marketing has been defined by developers. And I'm a big believer in the idea that if you look at kind of marketing practice, um, if you go back and look at the history of marketing to developers, traditionally done by developers, that actually tends to foretold uh, 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 
what's going to happen in marketing in general. And I like to go back even to some of the original kind of developed marketing stuff. Uh, most famously, you know, think about kind of the Mac platform launch in 1984, people like Guy Kawasaki, all those guys who you know. But if you think about what are the techniques of developer marketing, right, what did we have? We had online communities, we had user generated content, it was all content marketing, it was bottoms up, right, adoption into the enterprise. All the stuff that we're talking about is state of the art marketing practice today. All of that emanates from developers marketing to developers. Again, the point of which is, uh, Developers have often had a hand in uh, defining the future of marketing, so uh, feel like you're in good company as you continue to do so. Okay. This is one of my favorite ads of all time. Who doesn't love the next marketing stuff? This was the original uh, next uh, side of marketing. Really, the stuff that we think about in terms of customer acquisition, activation, retention, funnel, Right, all of those kind of marketing mechanics, which are of course essential to a company's success. You know, 10 years ago, you didn't find technologists and product people talking about those problems. So as a marketer, it's fascinating and encouraging uh, for me that there's so many new ideas coming into that space as that's now become, frankly, the domain of technologists, right? You would expect if you uh, interviewed a random developer tomorrow for your company uh, that they likely would have some aesthetic for you know how customer acquisition or activation or all those kinds of uh, growth mechanics or growth hacking works uh, and there are a lot of great people who um, are, are establishing that new art uh, someone I was lucky enough to work with Avon Kieran I encourage you to look at his stuff he ran uh, growth at Dropbox wonderful guy who's got a new startup called YesGraph um, all of which is to say that's not what I'm going to talk about today I love that stuff. Um, if there's questions in q and I'm happy to kind of speak to that. It's obviously essential. What's interesting to me is as those tactics and that kind of part of marketing has become, um, again, more the domain of people like us, startup people and product people, uh, there's still that top-down part, right? The stuff that's about the positioning and the pricing and the PR and sales enablement that still it retains a little bit more mystery and I think for many people I interact with in the startup community, it's something that somebody else does. And so what I was hoping to do today, I mean that we have in, uh, we're driving uh, our respective industries, right? That we are uh, an influential um, uh, center player uh, that is able to exert real importance and impact in whatever happening in the industry is. And certainly you can imagine um, how Apple Right, typifies that on you know, so many different dimensions. Uh, whether it's the transition from uh, desktop to mobile, obviously that's a massive strategic piece of property they own, whether it's the future of media, whether it's music, right? they occupy this incredibly strategic uh, position. Uh, the other uh, is the emotive dimension, right? and that's, it's the combination of these things I think that makes Apple uh, so powerful because of course Apple is this um, incredibly emotive, personal uh, uh, kind of brand. And I like to be explicit about that, because sometimes, you know, a lot of times when people like talk about Apple and, oh, gee, isn't Apple great? We love Apple and brands like Apple and Harley Davidson and stuff like that. It's like, well, you know what? Um, Harley Davidson is really right. Where would they fit on this graph? People love their products. They're passionate about them. But what's strategic about being a, you know, semi-commodity, uh, motorcycle manufacturer, right? It's actually probably not that awesome a business. So something like Harley Davidson, great emotive qualities, crappy strategic qualities, right? So what we're trying to do is do both. So that's the good news. The bad news is where all of you are today, because all of us are here today, which is in the opposite, opposite side, right?